Greetings, listeners, and welcome back to the podcast of Jewish Ideas, a Torah in Motion podcast. For those interested in the development of Jewish law and practice, the Mishnah is one of the most important works ever written. This major anthology of rabbinic texts, the first of its kind, dates to around the year 200 of the Common Era, and ever since then has been a foundational document of the Jewish religion. The Mishnah has invited a wide array of commentary, the most important of which, of course, is the Talmud itself. Yet it remains a distinct and somewhat enigmatic text. Today, we'll be focusing on this monumental work, exploring the Mishnah's origins, its composition, some of its ideas, its style, and its relationship to the texts and ideologies of its era. With us to shed light on the world of the Mishnah is Dr. Shia Cohen, Professor of Hebrew Literature and Philosophy at Harvard University. He is a renowned expert on the history and texts of the Jews in the classical period, having written and lectured widely on the subject. One of his principal areas of expertise is rabbinic texts, and he is one of the editors of a new translation and annotation of the entire corpus of the Mishnah, published last year by Oxford University Press, a truly monumental project, and uh, it is this that will be the subject of at least some of our discussion later on today. We're very grateful to have an expert of his caliber on today with us at the podcast of Jewish Ideas, Professor Cohen. Welcome. JJ, welcome to you. Thank you. Thank you for those lovely words. Thank you for being here. Um, so let's start a little bit with some of the historical context. The Mishnah is usually dated to around the year 200, give or take. Um, could you perhaps give us a little bit of context? What is going on in the Jewish world then, uh, within the Jewish communities, especially in the land of Israel, uh, where the Mishnah was composed? Uh, the short answer is we don't know. So we can move on to the next question, and that will save, save, save a lot of time. Uh, having, having said that, I can say one or two little things about it. Excellent. Yes. Right. So in the year 200 or so CE, what Christians call AD, but we, we refer to it as CE, but around the year 200 CE, the Jews of Judea and Galilee are part of the Roman Empire. Um, there are the headquarters of the Roman Empire in, in this part of the world is in Caesarea, uh, but many Jews lived in the north in the Galilee, some lived in the south in Lydda, uh, others lived in Caesarea itself. So uh, we have Jews living throughout the land of, of, is of Israel, and we have really two basic approaches how to understand their status. Are things going well or are things not going well? Right. Are they subject to persecution? Are they victims of Roman imperialism and colonialism? Right. Uh, are they harassed from pillar to post on the one hand? Or on the other hand, they have come to terms with the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire has come to terms with them. So a modus vivendi has been, has been worked out so that the leader of the rabbinic group in the land of Israel, Rabbi Judah the Patriarch, about whom we will speak more anon, right? He has worked things out with the Romans and such that we have stories in the Talmud that Rabbi Judah the Patriarch and the various Roman officials who go by various names Right, they're apparently palsy wowsy, as we say. Uh, they're getting along just fine. Uh, th th thank you. And perhaps, in fact, they're better than fine, maybe even very well. Thank you. Um, so these are two very different approaches to understanding the Roman, the Roman experience of the Jews in Judea. Uh, persecution on the one hand, uh, colonialism, imperialism on the other, right? Or, in fact, prosperity, perfectly reasonable conditions. And in fact, we're doing okay. Thank you very much. Those are two different approaches, and they go back actually to the Middle Ages, uh, by the sages of the Middle Ages, who are, some of whom pick the one, others pick the other. If I may ask, to which side do you tend to lean, if at all? I, uh, anytime I read about how persecution by the wicked, evil empires, you know, has ex will explain why we do or do not do this various custom say or do not say this prayer or, or, or whatever, I get, I get suspicious right away. Uh, this seems to be a default setting for many of our brethren, right, who love to talk about how persecuted we are. Maybe we are persecuted. I'm not denying we're persecuted. But does that explain all of these various uh, variations in liturgical practice, in law, in rabbinic law, in et cetera, et cetera? And there I'm, I'm a little skeptical. In fact, I like to, you know, I like to see evidence and the persecution that we see, we allegedly see in the third century, uh, Professor Liebman, Saul Liebman wrote in a famous article, Palestine in the third and fourth centuries, uh, and he argues that uh, there was no persecution. 
So Lehman says there was no prosecution. There was no prosecution. I see. I see. We uh, it, there are authorities in this tradition. Yeah, that's that. There are authorities. In the I world. see. I see. So Lieberman constituting one of them. Okay, fine. Fair enough. Um, so so then let me ask a little bit about the process of the composition of the Mishnah, um, because in general, in traditional terms, it is um, it is seen to be the work, or at least under the responsibility of one man, namely Rabbi Judah the Patriarch or Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi. Um, and then the question becomes: So how? Um, impactful was he? How strong was his editorial hand? Was he the author of every word in the Mishnah? Was he merely the editor? Or merely, I say, or was he responsible? Was he the end of a long process? What do we know, or what can we perhaps surmise from the evidence available, to use a more cautious term, um, regarding the composition of the Mishnah? Okay, so see previous answer, right? We don't know. That's, I see. Okay, that, that's, the, that's the short, to the point uh, answer. In other words, what we don't know exactly is are the stages of composition. We don't know exactly what sources were open on his desk that, such that he would, could use them at, at will. Uh, we don't know exactly who wrote what before Yudha so that we don't know exactly what Yudha did to what was there. So these things we don't know. We have very, very, very learned conjectures from some very great scholars over the centuries, who most of whom are far greater than I, and I will not, you know, dare to, you know, this criticize their opinions. But the fact is, we really don't know. Uh, and the fact is, it makes a lot of sense that Yudha Hanasi is not composing this from scratch. No, of course not. A book of the size and complexity of the Mishnah, no doubt he's incorporating sources. Now, that's always a tricky and devilish word, uh, sources. So what does it mean he's incorporating sources? Does he have actual books on his desk? Does he have ideas? Does he simply have various oral tradents who come through every so often on uh, on, on the Pony Express, right, and then tell them, you know, the latest uh, theories about, uh, about various sources. Uh, I'm making that part up. Forget, forget, delete that. Right. Um, but we don't re- really, we really don't, we really don't know. In other words, there's a distinction between saying he, he, Judah the Patriarch, has, is the recipient of many traditions, which no doubt he is, is the recipient of many uh, learned essays written by his contemporaries or earlier, I have no, no doubt. Written, I'm not sure about. I'll take back written. But that there were sources floating around out there which, which he used and tried to beat into a uniform shape so that we have something like a uniform style, which we do in the Mishnah. We have over, a th- in English, roughly a thousand pages, or sorry, two thousand pages of new translation. Uh, we have almost a, a uniform style from one end to the other, which is an extraordinary accomplishment considering the pre-modern technology. This is, you know, this is actually an extraordinary, an extraordinary thing. So that Yudha Nasi tried to create a uniform document, I think we can all agree, that he did made up the stuff. We can agree, of course, he didn't make up the stuff. That's, that's impossible. But what exactly did he have? What exactly did he get? And exactly in what form? And what exactly did he do? Well, those are questions that are very difficult still. Fair enough. In which case, let's turn to uh, perhaps the one place in the Mishnaic corpus in which the Mishnah itself tries to give perhaps a small uh, version of its own backstory, right? These are the opening right. uh, Mishnayot of Pirkei Avot, of the, the, the chapter often called Ethics of the Fathers. Um, and there, there is at least some sort, in that first chapter, a, a brief outline of a traditional history which goes as follows, which is that there was this uh, body called the Anshei Knesset HaGdola, the men of the Great Assembly, who received the tradition, whatever exactly that was, um, and um, and then passed it on to a series of seemingly a sort of a duumvirate, a two-headed form of leadership, various generations of Ishmael and Atalion and Hillel and Shammai, etc. Um, and then eventually, I suppose, to the um, to, to the Chachamim, well, these, the are, rabbis, these are called the pairs, usually. The pairs, yes, correct. Um, P-A-I-R-S. And, P-A-I-R-S, um, yes. Precisely. Uh, so my, my question, I suppose, is, you know, is this is this considered a, a reliable backstory? Is this supposed to be some sort of comprehensive history? Is this... You know, just a, a highlights of the what the rabbis consider to be their chain of tradition. What, how does how do contemporary scholars view these um, these mishnayot? Yeah, so just to, just to lay out some uh, initial uh, orientation to the question. Mm-hmm. So there are sixty three tractates in the Mishnah. Avot is one tractate. So even if you want to regard Avot as an infallible source for what it narrates, and I'll come back to that in just a moment. Right? We have to re- recognize that Avot is one tractate out of 63. Having said that, it is a very unusual tractate. Right. Right? It, it, it's rhetorically, uh, literarily, compositionally, it is unlike any other tractate in, 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 in the Mishnah. 
So even if you think it, it's the, the key or the clue, or the, the key that will unlock the, the mysteries of the Mishnah, uh, you have to admit that's not going to do that. It's, it is one unusual text out of, out of 63. So now what is Avot then? Right. I would say Avot can be looked at in one of two ways. You see, Shai Cohen seems to have a pattern here. Every yes, I, know. It's, I don't know, and there are two possible answers. So, you know, it's a good... Uh, <laughs> I'm happy to keep this pattern open. It's fascinating. Yes, exactly. Right. But, and you're, you already had your PhD exam, so you don't have to... You can, you can adopt any stance that you like. Ah, thank you. Okay. But we have, we have a choice. Is this history or is this theology? I think that fundamentally that's what, it come, that's what it comes down to. If it's history, and there are many scholars who, in fact, have tried or have assumed perhaps better, Right, have assumed that this narrative in the uh, first chapter of a vote, which begins with Moshe Kibel to Rami Sinai and goes down to Hill, the houses of Hill and Shammai, Yahuachim and Zakai and his five disciples, his five disciples. Uh, right. So many scholars would assume that this is quote historical. This is bona fide memory. This is uh, bona fide tradition. Uh, this, in fact, is a, win- a brief window, alas, but a window. Right into how the sages understood themselves, and there and there's no reason to doubt what they say. So these scholars would argue. So, for example, on Sheikh Nasser Agadola, so the men of the great assembly is how it's usually translated. What do we know about the men of the great assembly? Well, they're referred to right here in chapter one of a vote. So, well, there you go. So this means, therefore, that the men of the great assembly were a historical enterprise, were some sort of Senate Supreme Court. Judge, uh, the body of judges, uh, teachers, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Is that is that the way, way we should look at? Or do we recognize that Hashem and Hagadolah are extremely poorly attested? Take away this reference and about your left with even less than what you had uh, to, to start with, and the whole thing is probably <clears throat> say this too loud uh, to upset the neighbors, right? It was made up, right? Uh, we have a reference to the men of the great assembly or some sort of phrase like that in the first book, in the first book of Maccabees, if I remember it was chapter 14, if I remember it correctly, uh, that there was a men of the, there was a great assembly at the temple in Jerusalem. So we have various mysterious shadowy echoes of, of some, of something, right? And it's very possible that the sages after 70 will begin to work on what we call the Mishnah. Right. They were trying to put together into some coherent language and some coherent form what we might call a history or a proto or a proto proto history. But in fact, there's almost nothing there. Uh, it's it's simply naked because. If it's real, they didn't know anything about it either. They have no bona, they have no bona fide tradition short of the fact that this thing exists. And then they make up all kinds of stories. Well, they produce the prayer book. Uh, they produce uh you know, the our Torah reading customs go back to Sheikh Hasid Agdola or various other such things. But I would say summary, Professor Cohen, you're talking too much. Uh, Keep going, please. It's theology. It's not history. Of all chapter one is not history. It begins with Moses, Moshe Kibel Torami Sinai. That sounds like a theological statement to me. Moses received the Torah or a Torah, or I'm not sure exactly how to translate it. Moses received Torah. Well, let's leave out the, or, or the article. Moses received Torah at Sinai and transmitted it to Joshua. Now, here we're already, we're zooming through our, our biblical uh, history, and we are, what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, the, what's the theme of, of our chapter one? Our rabbinic tradition is authentic. Our rabbinic tradition comes from God, comes from Moshe, comes from, uh, from, from, from God to Moshe, from Moshe to the elders, to the elders, to the great, to the great, great teachers through the generations, through these mysterious pairs, whoever they were exactly, which we really don't know, right? Uh, these mysterious pairs, right? So that the bottom line is by the time we get to the Mishnah, by the time we get to Yochanan ben Zakkai and his five disciples, where chapter one ends, right? We, we can say securely, we who are believers, we who are ex- accept the truth of what our sages have taught us, we know that it's true. 
Now, that's not his, true in a historical sense. That's true in a theological sense. It is true because it comes from Moshe. It comes from God. We can trust it. It is reliable, right? Uh, that's how I understand about chapter one. It is fundamentally a theological statement, not a historical statement relying upon ancient records and archives and uh, et cetera. That's not likely. Interesting. So going on that theme of history, there's one remarkable element of the Mishnah, one remarkable um, stylistic feature of the Mishnah, yeah. which is that it doesn't seem to either acknowledge or to be terribly interested in um, its own place in history, if that makes sense. Meaning, that is good. That is it, it, is, it, it, it is written or composed in the century following major, major wars, following you know the destruction of the temple in 70 CE, uh, through a series of smaller wars, generally known as the Kitos Wars in the in the 110s and the 120s. And of course, the major disaster, which is the Bar Kokhba revolt, the, the failed Bar Kokhba revolt in, uh, in the 130s, which... Um, you know, in which most of the country was laid waste and incalculable amounts of of Jews were killed. Um, and yet, the, all true. sorry, and right, but the Mishnah doesn't seem to attest to any of this. Doesn't seem interested in any of this. Um, and and really, and and you know, just an example of this is that it treats the temple seemingly as though it's still standing. It, it's you know, it is immensely interested in the minutiae of what goes on in the temple. So why does the Mishnah? Ha- adopt this posture of being sort of removed from history. What, what is why? Why is that decide? Why is that the policy that is taken by the editors by the writers? See my earlier responses to your earlier question. <laughs> oh dear. Yes. So, well, I don't, we shouldn't exaggerate, but we should be very care- careful, right? Uh, that is, the, obviously, the temple's destruction is referred to in various places in the Mishnah. Yes, that's true. Not nearly as often as you would have thought. And not nearly with the kind of penetrating insight that you might have that you might have thought would be appropriate for the subject. Uh, similarly, the fall of Betar, which was Bar Kokhba's fort, fort, fortress, right? It is it is mentioned, uh, right? But again, not very often. And as you correctly note, the the Bar Kokhba war seems to have been a disaster on the same level as the destruction of the temple. And yet, the sages seem to just touch on these things, glance at it. From, from time, time to time, most of their most of their discussions, in fact, are not actually historical. Uh, see Shia Cohen's earlier comment, right? right? You know, they're they're not really historians. They're not really out to tell a narrative. That's not what they're doing. So, what are they doing? You're going to ask me. That was exactly okay. my next question. <laughs> How did you know? Right. So, what are they doing? So, I argue that although chapter one is theology. But our sages in the Mishnah fundamentally are not theologians. That's of chapter one. You get one chapter out of 524, if I remember correctly, right, in, in, the, in the Mishnah. Um, the rabbis are not the, theologians in, in our sense of the word theologians. They're not historians. They're, what are they doing? Boy, I would love to get sneak into Judah the Patriarch's work, work room, you know, and sort of sit, sit in, the, in the corner and just eavesdrop for a while. Right. But alas, we don't we don't have that. And as you said earlier, correctly, the Mishnah seldom talks about itself. Right. Abo chapter one would be an example where it does talk about itself. And there are a couple of other passages uh, where the Mishnah does talk about itself, kind of tells you what it, what it's what it's all about. But again, out of 500 and something chapters, the amount of such material is minute, is, is minute. The Mishnah fundamentally is living in its own world. Why is it doing that? Why did, what is what is it gained by adopting that stance? I'm really not sure. I've thought about this long and hard, and I don't really have an answer. But, of course, I would refer you to the new Oxford edition of the Mishnah with a very long and penetrating essay written by Shia Cohen, right, uh, where Shia grapples with some of these questions and is unable, in my opinion, to come up with a satisfactory or entirely convin- convincing uh, answer. Uh, the, the bottom line is the rabbis are not interested. They're not, they, I said earlier they are theologians, but I have to correct myself. They're not theologians. Because they're not interested in theology. Right? Does the Mishnah talk about theology? Yes, everybody knows chapter 10 of, of Sanhedrin, right? All the Israelites will share in the world to come. Footnote, that line is missing from many manuscripts. Back to our back to Interesting. Our I did not know that. Okay. Good All the Israelites will share in the world to come. Everybody knows the famous chapter and about, you know, what the Mishnah goes on to march its way through biblical history about you know, various evil people and the things that they did. And so to explain to you, all Israel will share the world to come, but these don't. But these don't. Right. 
that's a, that's the structure. Thing, but, the, but the line all uh, Israel has a share in the world comes missing from some of the ancient manuscripts that we have. That is correct. Interesting. It, it makes sense having met enough Jews. I, you know, I, I certainly <laughs> doubt that line. But um, <laughs> anyway. Um, okay, fine. Right. So, I'll say, so um, back to my point. My point simply was that the rabbis are not theologians in the sense that the rabbis don't, just as they don't expatiate on the destruction of the temple or expatiate upon the destruction of Be the fall of Beitar and Bar Kokhba, they don't expatiate upon any theological topic. What does the Mishnah have to say about the covenant between God and Israel? What does the Mishnah have to say about faith and free will, about the Messiah, the Messianic Redeemer? Okay, the Messiah is in chapter 10 of Sanhedrin. Okay, fine, fine. But I mean, I mean, dealing with one chapter out of 520, right? Uh, the amount of, amount of such reflection on these theological topics. What does the mission say about faith and free will? Uh, you know, all, all the standard theological topics. Now, the answer is either nothing or almost nothing. So, anyway, there you are. So when I shy said that there are theologians, he didn't mean theologians in the sense that, like, theologians. He meant theologians that they're not doing history either. Yeah. So, so, so then, in true Cohen style, I'd like to propose two different ways of, of looking at the fact that the, the, well, one is that the rabbis writing the Mishnah or Rabbi Yudan Asi presumes a network of uh, a framework yeah. of theology, a fra you know, a way of viewing the world, you know, a certain religious allegiance, a certain basic notion of covenant, etc. And therefore, he doesn't feel he needs to write it. He doesn't feel that it needs to be you know, okay. Fair, fair enough. And of course, the other is is the opposite, in which. The you know there is very little presumed or very little um, almost no consensus on these issues and therefore the Mishnah kind of retreats into its shell of legal uh, more abstruse and more um, you know pract practice oriented legal discussions. Right. The, the latter is it seems to me is slightly more uh, better than the former. I mean the Mishnah, or to put it differently, the Mishnah doesn't do what you want it to do. The mission doesn't do what I want it to do. The mission is going to do whatever it wants to do, and if you don't like it, that's just tough, right? Because the mission is whatever it is, and they're sort of living in denial of, of their of their time, which you might argue maybe that's evidence for the persecutorial theory from I mentioned before, but I'm not convinced. I'm not convinced of that. They're living in denial because oh, I just don't know right. why. Okay, fair enough. Um, another thing that I would have wanted the Mishnah to do, but it doesn't do, is, yes. is like any good academic, I would have wanted my students to quote their sources. Uh, of which course, is, yes. You want footnotes. I, I want the footnotes version. I, I want the footnotes or at least um, sort of parenthetical uh, quotes from the verses that they're basing themselves on because you read the Mishnah and it's you know, chapter after chapter after chapter and they're stating laws. But then, and of course, these are, it's a commentary of sorts on, on the Torah, on the, on the written Torah, except it doesn't, provide it's it doesn't quote it doesn't generally provide justification it just says what the law is what they think the law is right what can it why is it written like that what can explain that way this is an interesting way of of uh, writing a law code is it not yeah that's why i'm not sure it's a law code but no no one is either right it's not just me we're not sure what to, what to call it it's okay. sort of like a law code because the mission tells you lots of times what you're supposed to be doing what you're supposed to be avoiding See, it sounds like a law code to me, uh, except that it's written in a very odd way. And we can, once we start penetrating, looking closely at it, we realize it's not a classic law code by any by any stretch. It's it's something it's something different. So we we have to imagine that our sages, presided over by Jew the patriarch, you know, whipping them all into shape and getting everything into into squeeze into a thousand pages of the, of the book. That's a joke because we don't have book, books yet. We're still in the codex. codices. We're, we're in the age of transition to books, to book form, but we don't have books yet. Um, okay, so uh, so the sages are doing what they want to do. They're not doing what we want them to do. And it's remarkable that what they did is, as far as I could see, is unprecedented in Jewish history. Right. There is no book before the Mishnah that looks like the Mishnah, that sounds like the Mishnah, that feels like the Mishnah, has a texture, uh, a Mish Mishnahic texture, or in fact has the kind of orientation towards discussion, dispute, proof, counterproof. Right? Again, the Talmud expatiates more fully in, in this rhetorical mode, rhetorical mode of argument. Mishnah has argument, but it's typically short and dry. 
Rabbi Akiva says this, Rabbi Ishmael says that, Rabbi Eliezer says this, Rabbi Joshua says that, Rabbi Gamaliel says this, uh, etc., etc. But we have typically pairs. Why pairs? We like pairs. Right? Typically, most arguments in the Mishnah are reduced are two, X and Y. Yes, no, right, and left, yin and yang. Right? Uh, don't they ever have three and four times different arguments? Three occasionally, yes. I think. Yeah, three occasionally, you know, but you know, once again, this is, this is highly stylized. Highly stylized. Similarly, I assume when Rabbi Eliezer says Tame and Rabbi Akiva says Tahor, impure. Pure, when the sages, two of the classic sages of Eliezer and Akiva are, are, going, are going at it, right? I am assuming that Rabbi Eliezer said a lot more than the word Tame. Right. And I assume that Rabbi Akiva said a lot more than the one word Tahor. I'm assuming that Rabbi so and so said a lot more than guilty or liable, and Rabbi so and so said not guilty or not liable. Right? I'm assuming that they, there's a whole discourse that would have filled up the day, a week, a month. I, I, no, well, where is it? Yes. Why, why doesn't the Mishnah read like the Talmud, essentially? Exactly. So we're asking is why is the Mishnah the Mishnah and not the Talmud? So the Talmud, of course, as we all know, who, who love and study Talmud. Right, uh, is full of, in fact, proofs, counterproofs, uh, quoting scripture, qu quoting other verses from scripture instead, quoting Rabbi so and so opinion over there because it reminds me of the opinion over here, uh, and the argumentation over there somehow we think may have some bearing on, this, on the argumentation over here. That's a, every every page of the Talmud is like that. Right. The Mishnah. That's not what they're doing. They're doing something different. Is it is it a pedagogical technique? Because of course it's far easier to learn by heart a Mishnah that says Rabbi Akiva Omer Tahor, Rabbi Leza Amar Tameh, and that's it. And, and and that's much easier to remember than you know a massive folio of Talmudic discussion. Is is the reason it's written in such a sort of crabbed and and sparse format? Is it because they wanted people to commit it to memory? Is that possible? That's a great that's a great idea. Although all of us know that in our our history through the centuries. We have been blessed with many great scholars who are able to memorize anything and everything uh, in enormous quantities of material. I mean, we can all think of people who are blessed with this kind of memory. So I'm not sure that's the whole explanation, but yeah, the, the mission is highly stylized. In that sense, people have argued, well, maybe that's to make it easier to remember, to memorize, to refer to, uh, because it is so highly stylized. It is so formally uh, prescripted. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, maybe that's it. Um, then, then let me go on to another, again, there's so many curious facets or curious um, characteristics of the Mishnah that those of us who, you know, been learning the Mishnah as a childhood are so used to that we forget how unusual it is. There's right. another one I want to bring up, which is the, 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 the constant presence of arguments, right? And this is strange because you have nothing... Starting from page one, page one, paragraph one, right? From page one, paragraph one, all the way till right at the end, the whole thing is arguments. And, and this is strange because, you know, as we know from the Tanakh, it, it, it's not a running form of arguments and, and neither are any of the other texts from the, you know, the Book of Maccabees or, or you know, the Qumran literature. It's not running arguments, but the Mishnah is. This is odd, no? The Mishnah, the Mishnah is. And as far as I can see, it is the first such Jewish document that is of this quality, this type. Namely, Here's the case. Case is A, let's say, and Rabbi X and Y disagree about A. Right. What's next? Next paragraph. There's paragraph B. Ah, there's case B. Once again, Rabbi X and Y argue about paragraph B also. And we continue this way for several hundred pages, or in the New English, the Oxford English translation for 2,400 pages. We, keep, we just go on and on and on and on, right? in which we simply have a position of Rabbi X says this, Rabbi Y says that. Now, here comes the key point. Rabbi X and Y, as far as I can see, from the nature of the society in which the whole thing is embedded, right, X and Y do not regard each other as heretics. Right. X and Y do not regard each other as wicked or evil. X and Y do not regard each other as people who rejected the divine Torah. On the contrary, it's just the opposite. Right. This seems to be the way that they are expressing their, their Torah is precisely through argumentation. Now, again, it's not the rhetorically embellished argument we have in the Talmud. 
true, that's going to come next. That's going to, that's down the road, right? But here in the Mishnah, as far as I can see, is the first such document anywhere. Gumran scrolls are happy to yell at fellow fellow Jews for doing things wrong. Uh, and we we find you know that in various places in the in the in the Qumran scrolls, in a very different attitude than we have in the Mishnah, where we're going to say Eliezer and uh, Kiva, you know. Right, so they have a spat. Right. But fundamentally, they belong to the same partnership, the name net, the same network. What's the right? What's the right now to use? Um. Yeah. Network. The same. Um. Yeah. The same yeah. The same society. Stuff. The same. The same group. The same school. The same forum. I'm, I'm not sure what what now to use. So, so then the question becomes: Why? Why was this format kept? Meaning. You know, so, so you have several um, academies, let's say, of scholars arguing about the law. But if it is a law code, and this, I suppose, gets back to the question that we were asking, uh, is it in fact a law code? Because surely a law code would want to have a... Um, exactly. Guilty. Not guilty. Yes. No. Permitted. Uh, uh, not permitted. You know, that's what you expect. Yes. Right? But it doesn't. It doesn't. I feel this is a bit unfair because I keep on asking you questions that I feel I should be directing to Rabbi Huda Hanasi. It's a bit unfortunate that uh, you know <laughs> I'm asking you to speak in Very his unfortunate. name. Very unfortunate. I would so dearly love to have a few minutes alone with Yehuda Hanasi. I think would be really, really rewarding. Right, but but you say this is unique and, and, and unprecedented. I believe that it is. If you can show, uh, give me an example to show that I'm wrong, I would happily learn from you. But I have looked and looked and looked. And there is no document like this, where again we have argumentation in which the partners to the argument are not not dismissing each other as heretics. Rather, they are they are rather looking upon each other as I don't know engaged in the work, holy work of the Lord as in the interpretation of God's Torah. Is that the way to phrase it? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm not I'm not sure. But I, I guess so. That's the nice that's the nicest way to phrase it. Right, that uh, this is what God wants us to do, uh, which is to study, to study the study the Torah, not necessarily come to agreement, but to agree that we're going to study the Torah. Right. And then we have these pairs of, of arguments all the time, A and B, A and B. Uh, and if I can ask, I mean, so in what other ways does the Mishnah differ? Because uh, we have quite a, quite a lot of Jewish literature, let's say, from the, the late. Uh, right. So as you said, as you said earlier, the, the Mishnah. Seems to well, the word that I used in the introduction to the translation was obliviousness, right? right. That they, they seem to be living in oblivion. They are living in this make-believe, self-contained world, which they argue with each other about points of law, most of which, many of which I didn't count, right? Most of which have no actual contemporary relevance whatsoever, because the temple has been destroyed. The priestly the the laws of uh, purity and impurity are on, the, on their way out, as anybody, anybody can see. Uh, and anybody can see. Uh, many details of the holidays, for example, we can't observe because we don't have the temple any, any longer. Right. So the festival celebrations are, well, I don't know what they are, but we can't do them because there's no, there's no, there's no temple, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the Mishnah is living in a make-believe world world of fantasy right? do you think it's it's reasonable that the rabbis writing the mishnah would have expected the world of the temple to return given that the bar kokhba revolt had failed you know spectacularly failed and the country had been essentially laid waste only half a century earlier um were they expecting that the temple would be rebuilt and their text would be um you know this text would serve as an instruction manual yeah. for for you know the student to be rebuilt uh Beit Mikdash? Right. This is a commonly held view. Uh, as always, I like to find evidence for these views like these, these macro views that will explain to me the Mishnah. Uh, and I, I'm not so sure that the sages believed in the return of the Messiah. You know, the Messiah, I believe. Sure, that sounds very plausible, given what we know about the Jews of antiquity. Right. They're always living on the edge. Uh, OK, so they, they lost. There was a, the temple was destroyed. Right. The, the land of Israel was uh, laid waste in large chunks, especially in the south. In the south, not so much in the north, but especially in the south. Um, and therefore, many Jews would have presumably felt a strong yearning for the rebuilding of the temple the re and, and the return to Jerusalem, which, by the way, may I remind you, the Romans have kicked the Jews out. So there yes. are no Jews anymore in Jerusalem. Right. So it was illegal, we, yeah. 
we are ready to return to Jerusalem, we need to return to Judea, we need to rebuild the temple, right? And many Jews would have believed that. I, I find that complete, completely plausible. Um, Interesting. I, I, I know, by the way, as soon as you opened your mouth and said that this is a commonly held view, I know that this is a term of abuse coming from you. So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, uh, that's something you're well, about to shoot down. It would be nice, wouldn't it, you know, if they if the rabbis in the Mishnah had said something akin to what I just said. Right. That, that, would, that would have been nice. That would have been nice. Uh, instead, they give us this never-never land, this fantasy land, inhabited by the Mishnah, inhabited by the sages, inhabited by the priests, inhabited by the temple, right? It's all this, this fantasy world, which doesn't exist in reality. But if you want to close your eyes, you can just, just pretend, well, maybe it's on its way back. R- right. I don't, this, I suppose, gets the question underneath this, which is whether Jews resign to their fate or not. You know, were they right? For, for those listeners listening on audio, uh, Professor Cohen just shrugged his shoulders. Uh, that wasn't clear to our <laughs> listeners, but uh, <laughs> yes, he just shrugged his shoulders. Okay, um, I want to draw attention a little bit to, to um, something else regarding the Mishnah, which is um, regarding its sectarian context, um, in the sense uh, that there yeah, are that's some. A, that's a difficult question. Okay, yes. So, so there are some who claim um, that the Mishnah is was composed or can, large, can be explained in large part by the rabbis. Um, you know, desire to separate themselves, let's say, from from Christianity, separate themselves from other Jewish, what they considered heretical sects, um, of various kinds. Could you perhaps speak to this a little? I think there's no no question, which means, of course, there is a question, as as you, as, you, as you know. As soon as the professor says there is no doubt, you know right away, of course, that there is doubt. Yes. So just just to make it clear, right? So there is no doubt, right, that the Mishnah, in part derives from sectarian sources, i.e. Second Temple Judaism was a complicated thing. Lots of lots of different schools and thoughts. I'm not sure what labels to put on them. We want to call them Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes. Uh, I'm not sure what we gain with these labels, because these labels are fundamentally also unknown. Right. But we, we have we have various groups, various groups, and no doubt, which means doubt, and no doubt, right, Many of their these schools of thought, these um, whatever we call them, right, feed into the mission. So you know, in an earlier art, in an article I wrote many years ago, you know, trying to identify what are the kinds of groups that would have been the sources for the Mishnaic uh, legislation. So priests, for sure, maybe some sectarians, right? Maybe uh, you know, other, I'm trying to find social groups. Right, that would have contributed to the to the mission, and I think there would have been many. Now, the interesting one is, well, how about heretics? How about heretics? Do they contribute to the writing of the, of the mission? Right. Um, the Hebrew word is minim. Right. Min is a min is a heretic. Minim are heretics, and minut is heresy. This is this this is the standard translation. I have nothing better to offer, so I'm perfectly happy to 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 live with it. So it's interesting that the Mishnah does refer explicitly with these terms, min, minim, minut. But as usual, the Mishnah will disappoint, because out of the out of the 2,000-something pages uh, of the translation of the Mishnah, I think three or five, right, are t- contain texts that refer to these these labels, these ca- these categories. And who would who or what in fact are these categories, and what do they mean, and what are their what's their implication? So uh, my my good friend, you know Daniel Bayarin, whom I've known for a very very long time, uh, and I say this because I'm I'm trying to be very friend, friendly to someone whom I respect immensely, is a very learned guy. Uh, so then, da- so Professor Bayarin argues, right, that the Mishnah is in fact is creating a world which recognizes heresy, and before the Mishnah we have we don't have any text that recognize heresy in quite this way, and therefore. Contrary to what Professor Cohen said earlier, where the Mishnah is a kind of broad, expansive, inclusive sort of umbrella, um, umbrella, right? Professor Bayarin is arguing just the opposite, right? That the the Mishnah is exclusive. Uh, we know the Mishnah has invented a category of heresy which was previously unknown. Well, here I come back. I come back to my numbers. Add up all the references to mean, minim, and minut in the Mishnah. How, how much are you going to get? I've done this. You've Remember actually sat and added up the numbers. 
Yes, you have around nine passages, and it adds up to two pages, three pages, three pages. Right? Remembering the Mishnah and translation runs to well over a thousand pages in this translation, and the new translation to 2,400 pages. In other words, this, this, one could read through the whole entire Mishnah, and just as one can might occasionally overlook the fact that the temple is destroyed, you can also overlook the fact that there are heretics. Because the, the attestation for this category is in fact slim in, slim indeed. Now I would argue the great accomplishment of the mission is, as I said earlier, just the opposite. Not that we're living in a world full of heresy who needs to be kept out. We're living in a world of diversity in which we want to keep everybody in. Why? Well, the temple just destroyed. The Romans said, you know, give us their bloody nose. You know, we got, you gotta, gotta be reasonable here. Uh, try to reestablish Jewish society or something like that is, I think, going on, going on in the, in the, in the, in the Mishnah's view. So having said it, go back to heretics. So I'm, I have no doubt that heretics also, there being various groups who are labeled with the label heretics, may also have contributed to the Mishnah alongside the various other, other, other groups. But at the end of the day, though, it's still, they're not the major component. They're certainly not the major innovation of the Mishnah, right? This is two pages, three pages. So, so I was according to this, this um, I suppose, theology of openness um, that you proposed here, so that this would explain why, for example, in the... A chapter that you mentioned earlier, the tenth chapter of Sanhedrin, which outlines a little bit some kind of of, of theology within the Mishnah. So you could claim that the theology outlined there is is very, um, I'd say, either very broad or also very a limited uh, outline of theology. It's not it's not anything like Maimonides' really, thirteen principles. Yeah, exactly. I wouldn't call this theology. You know, are you going to compare this with Augustine? Right. Are you going to compare this with Gregory of Nyssa? You know, you want theology? I'll give you theology. Right. That's theology. Right. But this in the Mishnah? A, a few I, statements, vague and uh, inconclusive. Um, that's very interesting. I want to press it, if I can tempt you, uh, down a rabbit <laughs> hole, which I know that uh, we've discussed on occasion. In fact, I sat in quite a few of your classes on the subject, which, which again, quite briefly, because we, we don't have so much time left, um, on, on specifically on the Christian question. Um, which is an the opinion, Christian question, yes. The Christian question, which is that you have a, an opinion regarding what is sometimes known as the parting of the ways, the point in which Jews and Christians branch off from one another. Um, and and uh, you mentioned Professor Boyarn before, and he, you know, his his opinion is that this happened fairly late. This happened, you know, um, what is it, third, fourth, fifth century, whatever exactly. Third, fourth century, perhaps even even later, perhaps, perhaps even later. It, which is, and he says that that is the point that Jews and Christians could could be told apart, whereas you um, seem to, you know, Kedar Kachab Kodesh seem to have a, <laughs> let's say, what might be called a more old fashioned opinion on the subject. Um, could you perhaps outline what that is? Yeah, well, uh, briefly again. Um, so it is very fashionable to argue again here, Professor Bjorn has won today. Perhaps I'm a little jealous. Maybe that's why I reject what he says. Or it's, it's, it's cannot so frame in the usual sense. When sages, what do sages do? They disagree. What do scholars do? They disagree. Right. So Professor, so Professor Bjorn's theory, or thesis rather, is that theologically speaking, what distinguishes Jews from Christians is not theology. Sorry, that's what Shia Cohen's going to say. It's not theology. Right. Because Bjorn says it is theology, but it takes a long time, and the, the and the theology of the one is often confused or is seen as synonymous with, with, with the other. Namely, we have into, you have a, the, the chief God. Of course, everybody has a chief God. You have intermediary powers. Yeah, you have a messianic redeemer sort of intermediating between the God and, and the people. Yeah, Jews have that. Christians have that. Yeah, uh, you can go down the list and discover there are various the theological statements or truth claims by Jews and Christians that are very similar to each other. Very similar to each other. And therefore, Professor Bayarin argues, you see, Jews and Christianity are fundamentally indistinguishable, right, for a long time. What's a long time, you ask correctly? Well, it is a little fuzzy what exactly is a long time, but a long time certainly well beyond the second century of our era, well into the third, perhaps the fourth, perhaps even beyond, even beyond. That's, uh, that's Professor B.R.N.'s theory, which he argues with a great deal of erudition and uh, pizzazz. Uh, okay, now I am not convinced of this at all, 
it seems to me the way to tell Jews apart from Christians is not to sit them down and give them a theology exam, but rather is to look at social structures, to look at uh, what institutions they have created, who is in charge, power structures, um, who is in charge, how discipline is, is imposed upon on the group, right? I want to see how these function in social terms. That will tell me whether these groups are confused or not confused, whether they in fact are one and the same, or they in fact are, are mortally distinguishable from, 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 each, from each other. And lo and behold, Professor Cohen argues that when you look at the question that way, and you keep theology in the footnotes, and you're looking instead at social political realia, it's by the second century everybody knows who's a Christian and who's a Jew. The Romans had no trouble telling Jews and Christians apart. I know that because when they're persecuting Jews, they're not persecuting Christians. When they're persecuting Christians, they're not persecuting Jews. Uh, so the Romans somehow could figure this out. If Romans could figure this out. I don't see why we can't figure this out either. Uh, again, there's going to be some fuzziness, no doubt. There could be some examples of things that don't quite fit his theory or mine. That's fine. Okay, I, can, I can live with that. We need to live with uncertainty in this business. That, that's fine. But at the end of the day, I think if you focus on social political realia and not on theologumina, the right, then you can see that Jews and Christians, oh yeah, by the early second century, there's no question. Jews are over here. Christians are over there. The Romans are persecuting them, but they're not persecuting them. Interesting. There. Um, so, uh, so, JJ, are you convinced? Um, of course, I'm convinced. Remember, you want to get a PhD. Remember. Yeah, PhD. I, I was going to say. For, fortunately, you're not on my committee, or unfortunately, I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, but but yes, that was the, the plan at, at some point anyway. Um, I, I, so, so one last question. This is interesting. This is a good segue um, into one last question, specifically on the Mishnah uh, as a whole. Before I move a little bit into asking about your new translation, um, which which is as follows: something you touched on there, which is social structure, because there are some who claim, or, or, or let's say the following: traditionally. Uh, one looks at the Mishnah, and and many have seen in it in the past a portal into the the, the world of Jews in the second and third century. Right? It's it sort of this shows how Jews lived, how Jews practiced their Judaism, how Jews um, you know viewed the world, and, and what kind of things they were arguing about, what kind of things they were interesting. Um, whereas others have you know looked at the Mishnah and seen it as the small concerns of a very small elite. In other words, that we cannot see. Uh, we cannot deduce good historical data, let's say, about the way Jews lived or, or, or what they believed or what they, how they practiced uh, during that time. Uh, and again, I, this is sort of a repeated question I've asked several times, which is, where do you fall on, the, on this continuum? Meaning, do, do you think the Mishnah really reflects the fullness, in a way, of Jewish life in Eretz Israel around the year 200? No, the answer clearly is no. Okay. Uh, and, and, uh, what the Mishnah does show me with exquisite detail, exquisite detail, is the various parts of a saddle. Various parts of the saddle? Of the saddle. The okay. various parts of a loom. I'm, I'm referring now to various uh, chapters oh, of the of Caleb. Caleb. You, want to, you want to understand the reality of life in the antiquity? There is no better source than Masech of Caleb. Masech of Caleb, in which we have, as I said, a whole chapter describing what is a loom. Or, and all the various parts, because we're interested in if, if they come in contact with impurity, does the impurity extend to the whole entire loom or only to various pieces of it? And similarly, you have problems with a separate Shabbat. The laws of Shabbat and the laws of holiness, or sorry, impurity, often, coinc uh, often coincide. Uh, okay. I'm being half facetious here, but you know, here, again, here again, we have reality. Right, reality. We, again, not that it may not be accurate in every detail, or maybe even extremely accurate. I don't know. I've, I have not studied this material sufficiently closely to make a conclusion. Right. But this is a window into reality of life, pots and pans, the Judaism of pots and pans. Right. That you clearly see. Now, what else do you want to see? You want to understand, well, what's it like to go to shul on Shabbat? Uh, that's going to be harder. Because their mission doesn't tell you very much, aside from what you have in Megillah or Paragimel. Otherwise, there's almost nothing nothing about going to shul. Uh, how about other rituals? Well, here is where the mission disappoints. Right? The mission does not describe for me what it's like to go to shul on Shabbat. What it's like to have a whole village with the Eruv around, around the village so that everybody is eating together. Well, that's kind of a very powerful social 
boundary. So tell me more about it. I'd love to know more about it. How did this work exactly? Right. So there's so much that the mission doesn't tell us that we actually feel disappointed when you see, well, they could have treated these subjects the same way they treated Masechet Kaling, where they're treating a saddle and a loom, which is exquisite, the extraordinary detail. I admit, it's almost impossible to figure out what, what on earth is going on. It's, I can't figure out exactly. I don't know how a loom fits together, so um, I got a problem. Right, right. And, and similarly, the various... Those weren't on your doctoral exams, Professor? No, yes. You know, or the various parts of a saddle. Right. Right. Or the famous book by, Yochan, by Yonatan Brand, Klei HaCheres by Mishnah by Talmud. Right. Pottery, right, the Mishnah and Talmud. is a whole giant book, right, on, you know, what we know about ancient pottery from the Mishnah. Uh, for some people, this is, you know, there's no greater joy than reading these things and re reconstructing this aspect of reality. I confess that this is not... My cup of tea, although I'm yeah. delighted that God has given us people who are, who, for whom it is their cup of tea, and they enjoy working on it, and I wish them well and, and success. Right. But unfortunately, I would love the mission to give me the same kind of detail to talk to me about what's it like to go to shul on Shabbat, or how Shabbat works in the village, or Masechah Shabbat is chock full of things that are well cl close to incomprehensible, beginning with the very first line. Translate. I mean, the general the translation that is usually given is those you know the, the the categories of carrying of of taking out an object on Shabbat. So that is two out of the four <laughs> two, from two in to out, out two. and two out of the four out to in, something like that. But you're right. It's a very enigmatic way, a strange way of putting it. Yeah. You know, so what's clear to me is that one thing we haven't mentioned, which I think we should mention, is that Yehuda Hanasi, let's just say I'm, I'm adopting the traditional ascription that he is, he's the main man right behind the Mishnah. Yehuda Hanasi was not engaged in outreach. Interesting. Yehuda Hanasi was doing the opposite. He, he edited and produced a book that is stone. Stone. Stone, made out of stone. Right? That's the term Zachariah Frankel refers to it in this way, and I think it's a brilliant description because the mission is so hard and it is so unyielding and tells you absolutely nothing except for what you need, and even then doesn't tell you what you need. Right? Right? The mission, as a result, is resists almost any attempt to tame it. Of course we tame it. We have the great minds over the two, last 2,000 years. There were written commentaries galore on the Mishnah and uh, the Talmud and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But the fact is, at the end of the day, this is an extraordinarily tough, unyielding uh, a document. And if your goal was to spread the light of knowledge of Torah to the masses, then the Mishnah is completely <laughs> the wrong way to go about it. I see. So it's an internal rather than an external document. Correct. That's, that's what I would argue. I would argue it's written by a small group, coterie of experts, Right, for a small group of coterie of experts. And as far as the other people walking down the street, they don't know what's going on, well, that's their problem. Interesting. Whereas uh, what, what I suggested earlier is that the Mishnah is written in a very sparse way precisely to allow for, let's say, non-scholarly folk to, uh, to be able to memorize. So. You know, as I said, to... begin with, let's start with Masech and Shabbat. It's Yotah Shabbat 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 Right. right, JJ, can you make? Uh, can we make sense out of that? Yes, we put our heads together. We can work on it. Right. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I admit, uh, I admit defeat on that one. Um, so it, excellent. So talking of, um, you know, centuries of taming the Mishnah ah, yes. and domesticating uh, it. Let's move on. A recent, a recent uh, enterprise. I understand. Precisely. So I have heard a recent enterprise. Um, now you are one of the three editors of a major um, a new translation annotation of the Mishnah uh, put out last year by Oxford University Press. As you said, it runs to 2,400 pages. Um, I think I'm doing you a bit of disservice from saying that you are one of the editors. You were the one who came up with this idea, who pushed this idea, who essentially shepherded it. I mean, you know, yes. yes no. That, that, is, that is correct. I'm happy to share my, my work with my friends and neighbors. Right, Chaim Lappin, and alas, the late lamented Robert Goldenberg, mm -hmm. who alas did not live to see the thing completed. He lived long enough to know that we were going to finish it. I mean, he he was on it, literally on his deathbed, and he held the proofs in his hand. So he he, he knew that we we had succeeded, but alas, uh, the, the final product he did not live to see. 
So Chaim Lapin is an old friend, a former student of mine. So uh, I began the project as a solo project. I remember thinking to myself, I know the mission is hard, but gee, how hard is it? I've been studying mission since the fifth grade. Can't be that hard. Can't be that hard. Well, so I decided to pick myself at Shabbat as my opening Masefet to see how long this would take me. And after working on around half or so of Masefet Shabbat, I then did some quick calculation, and I realized even 120 years from the from the Abish that wouldn't wouldn't be sufficient sufficient to complete complete the task. So I turned it into a group project, and then with Chaim, Chaim and Bob Goldenberg on board, we made it into a bigger group project. So we have a total of 50 contributors. Uh, to, to, the, to this project and a total of 2,400 pages approximately. Uh, and of course, as I look, every time I open it up, I'm always terrified that I'm going to find a mistake or I'm going to find a typo. And I, I just don't, I can't, I can't worry about it anymore. It's not perfect. I, I fully agree. It's not perfect. Maybe someday Oxford will produce a second edition. Maybe. We're coming out with a paperback. It's coming out in the fall. Tell oh, you oh it is? Oh, good. Yeah. Um, because I, I was going to say, because usually when I, you know, talk to with a guest about a book, I actually hold the book up in my hand. Unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the three volumes of the Mission of Oxford University Press because I believe that the current going rate. Ah, you have it in your hand. But I believe the current going rate is six hundred and eighty dollars. Um, no, that was the that was the initial price, and oh, I, I I had a friendly uh, series of arguments with my friends at Oxford University Press, where I tried to convince them that this was completely the wrong strategy. They completely got it wrong. So I don't know if it's because they listened to me or they didn't listen to me, but whatever. But come the fall, God willing, Oxford has told me we're going to publish a soft cover edition of the three volumes uh, for a total of $85 American. Wow. Okay. Right, so $85 I'm, I'm... American. I said, okay, that you, know, you, are, you are forgiven. I, I think my <laughs> meager PhD stipend might even cover that. Um so I was going to say, I mean, you know, congratulations, obviously. And, and I was going to say also, unlike most group projects, this one's actually rather good. So um, <laughs> congratulations on that. Um, so so it's funny because a, a couple of months ago, I had a Robert Alter here on the podcast, Jewish Ideas. And I, I asked him a question I'm about to ask you, which is that every new translation of something presupposes something wrong. You wouldn't have embarked on this project if you thought that previous translators and translators... Ten plus, years of, ten plus years of my life, I, I, did this I, I was going to say, you wouldn't have spent that time and the energy and, and roped in pretty much all the major, you know, English-speaking Talmudic and, and Mishnaic scholars on the planet into this project had you not thought that this was necessary. So, I mean, why did you feel the mission needed a new translation? And, and what were the deficiencies you were seeking to correct? And what were you trying to achieve, essentially, with this project? Well, I'll share with you a moment. So the moment was... When the Jewish Study Bible came out, okay, I'm sure you've had people speak about the Jewish Study Bible on your show, or if not, they will be. Uh, no, not yet, but it'll happen. Well, whatever, way. whatever, whatever. So there's the Jewish Study Bible, and I'm opening up and looking at it, and I said, "That's I had a moment. I said to myself, Bible, Bible is easy. Bible doesn't need annotation. Anybody can read the Bible. The Mishnah is hard. The Mishnah needs annotation. Right? We we owe responsibility to our audience." People who want to read the Mishnah and can't. Right. Now that I think is more or less true. I mean, the details of my story may be slightly embellished, right? But it was some, <laughs> something, something like that. As often as right. in other words, I, I had the sense that the Mishnah really is. See that reference to lapidary style, there we go, Arya Frankel, right? That is the stony exterior, right? This unyielding text, right? Which is so technical. Right, and so difficult, and it is well nigh, impenet- well nigh impenetrable. Even for those of us who have studied it since the fifth grade, it is still an extremely difficult book. So I, I had the bright idea, that's what the world needs, is the Oxford Annotated Mishnah. Oxford Annotated Mishnah. Right, so that's a moment of inspiration. Now, there are other translations out there, some which are six volumes long, like Black Philip Blackman. Each, each volume is devoted to a Seder. Or we have Art Scroll with their almost endless series of volumes on, on the mission. I can't even remember what, what the t- final running total is. Right? But we're talking here about you know dozens uh, of volumes. So our goal was, and here I did see Chaim and uh, Bob Goldenberg join me with this in the vision. The goal was to provide enough information to the reader so the text makes sense. And then to stop. To write a commentary is easy. Anybody can sit down and write a commentary that goes on for hundreds of pages. 
No, no, no sweat, no sweat. Right. But they have a brief so that it helps the reader understand what's going on and then stops. That was the goal that we, we could, all of us who contributed to this project, at least I've tried to convince them all along the way, right, that that's our goal. Our goal is not to go right and on endlessly, and I feel guilty that I think I'm, in the second ship, might as well have the longest in, in, the, in the Mishnah, in this Oxford Annotated Mishnah. I think I did not heed my own advice. Well, uh, all right. So what can, what can yes. we do? Right. But the goal is to, not just to translate it, because a bare naked translation is incomprehensible. I know that because people look at Jacob Neusner's one volume Yale University Press translation or her, the ancient Herbert Dandy from the 1930s, which are perfectly fine pieces of work, each of them. I have no, no serious complaints. I don't think you can fetch about this, fetch about that, but doesn't, no, they're fine. But the problem is they don't help the reader. The reader is kind of stuck. How are you going to make sense out of the Mishnah while well, you're giving us a bare naked translation? So you have to provide something. But I don't want to provide them with dozens of volumes. Then that's another way of killing the reader, right? Who's going to who's going to be able to cope with, cope with this? So the trick is provide enough information to the reader so the text makes sense. I would like to think that we accomplish this goal most of the time. I would like to think, right? And when you buy your eighty five dollar edition, JJ, and you're able to yes. look at it more carefully, I hope that you will tell me that we succeeded in achieving this goal. But frankly, I'm not sure we did because it's just playing very hard. Right. Okay. F fair enough. Uh, let me ask you, um, and, and we're running out of time, so, so maybe one or two last questions, because I okay. do remember you once giving a lecture about difficulties in translating certain concepts in the Mishnah that appear in the Mishnah in different places and mean different things at different points. So it, the example you gave there, I think, in that lecture was Adam. And, and what does Adam mean? Yes, it does Adam mean. Yes, I have a, one of my newest published essays is on that subject. Yes. I see. So, so, so then let me ask you, you know, did this come up frequently where you have certain core concepts which actually come, which pop up occasionally, but in important places, but there is no consensus in what that term means at any given point? Welcome to the meetings of our uh, editorial committee, the three of us, Chaim, uh, Bob Goldenberg, and I. I see. Which I'll say at least once a month we get together on Zoom or some equivalent, right, and argue, right? What's the best way to translate it? And no less important, is it okay if I translate the word this way over here, but I translate it differently over there? Interesting. And what was the conclusion of that? Because that's always a sticking point. That one, I that one, I think I won. Right. Uh, my two colleagues were convinced that we should have tables and tables and charts and charts and charts, so that every time you see the word kad or chavit, right, you translate it the same way every single time. Shaya said. No, if it's a technical term, you can translate it the same way every single time. But it's just a word. You got to see what fits in, what makes the, what makes the most sense. And no one expects the same word to appear every single time across 2,400 pages, right? They, people just don't necessarily ex expect that. And why? Sh and why should they? Why shouldn't there be some variety? If Chaim translates this masecha this way, and Bob translates the masecha that way, then well, the translation over here doesn't have to match the translation over there, does it? So Shia said, doesn't have to match. Bob and Chaim originally said, yes, it should match. It should be, if the text, underlying text is verbatim the same as the two parallel passages, the translation should be verbatim the same. And I said, well, no, because the translator is different. Interesting, interesting. And, okay, that, yes, uh, in general, I, I would tend to be sympathetic with you, but it's, it's, a, it's a very tough question. It's um, a tough question. We spent a lot of time discussing this. Yeah. Um, interesting. I wanted to also, um, you know, I, I think we'll end off with with a question like this as follows, which is that okay, so you finished your, this this mammoth three volume uh, work on the Mishnah. What what is next on the horizon for Mishnaic studies? Uh, if, if some, I, I thankfully am in the modern period, so yes. uh, you know this is not for me. But if a colleague were to be looking to do some work in the in the Mishnaic uh, area, what are the big questions or what are the Areas that need to be elucidated. JJ, you should write a book about Jewish apostates. I think they're interesting. Jewish apostates. That that a, a whole shelf wouldn't um, <laughs> wouldn't be sufficient. Anyway, for that. I'm joking. Because okay, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I lost track of the question now because what, what is what is on the horizon of Mishnah oh, yes, studies? On the horizon of Mishnah studies. Yes. Well, I know what's on the horizon for Shia Cohen. 
Assuming, assuming the average that gives me sufficient strength and sufficient ears. Okay. Well, right. I, I need to convince the world that Professor Bayarin for all his erudition is wrong. I see. Hmm? Okay. I, a, a worthy cause, I should think. A, a, right. That's what I. That's what I need to do. That's what I'm working on. Okay. That's what I'm, work, that's what I'm working on. Um, it's a kind of, but it's you know it's, it, that, that too is a large and complicated question, uh, obviously, uh, and this question about which scholars may simply agree to disagree, obviously. Right. right, but that that's what's on our missionary horizon uh, for me. Um, and the rest of the world, I think, well, a few years ago, we all discovered Iran when it, for the study of the Babli. We realized that the Babli is an Iranian document or written in Iranian society. And consequently, perhaps we should devote some knowledge, learn, to some time and energy learning Iranian. So that, that's, that was a discovery of several, of, well, 20 years ago, let's say, something something like that. So the full took scholars that long. There's know. something so there's an analog to that going on, which is to say that people read the Bobbly and they find Christianity everywhere in the Bobbly. Uh, you, you mean not you, you mean the Bobbly? You meant the Mishnah? No, I meant the Bobbly. Oh, the Bobbly. Okay, fine, interesting. Right, the, the Bobbly is more capacious than the Mishnah, right? Yes. So the Bobbly has all kinds of stories that are hidden or huge testimony to interactions between Jews and uh, Christians. Again, this sounds like the, the Boyarin-esque thesis, and may, maybe in fact it is, but uh, this has been, uh, for the last 10 years or so, there's been a great deal of discussion of looking at rabbinic literature for covert allusions to uh, Christians and, and Christi Christianity. And maybe this is what Professor Collins going to have to deal with, ultimately, when he ever finishes his current book. Uh, is that true? Do we, do we have these numerous covert references? But there is a clear sense out there in the world that the Bobli is a place to look. The Bobli is encyclopedic. Bobli is has diverse coverage of all kinds of questions. The Bobli is a lar even larger than the Mishnah, uh, more wide ranging than the Mishnah, and it's full of all kinds of stuff. The Bobli is like an encyclopedia, and that I think is where we're going right now with, with the Bobli. Once we took care of the Iranians, the next thing to do in the Bobli is Christ Christians. That's what's happening right now, and maybe Professor Cohen will contribute to that discussion. Okay, that sounds fascinating. Professor Shai Cohen, thank you very much for joining us today on the podcast Jewish Ideas. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, JJ. I had a lovely time chatting, chatting with you, as always. As always. Uh, yeah, sure, I a to you, and I wish you continued success. This has been the podcast of Jewish Ideas by Torah in Motion, produced by Alicia Kelman and myself, JJ Kimchi. Edited and mixed by Alicia Kelman. You can stay up to date by subscribing in your favorite podcast app. To support more thoughtful Jewish content like this, please visit torahinmotion.org slash donate. 